All right, well, welcome everybody. Uh, this is another TDI critical mass timber meetup, actually the first of the year, as I was mentioning. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Evan Schmidt. I am the outreach manager at Tallwood Design Institute, and I'll be emceeing the meetup here tonight. For those of you who don't know about Tallwood Design Institute, we are a multi-university and interdisciplinary organization that focuses on driving research and education in the mass timber space. Um, I'm not going to give a long spiel here, but I encourage you to check out our website at tallwoodinstitute.org. I'll put the link in the chat in case you want to do a little digging. Uh, and you're also feel to, feel, uh, free to reach out to myself or one of our directors, um, Ian or Judith. I know Judith's in the, in the group tonight. Um, yeah, and I'll pop that URL in the chat, as I said, as well as my email. So Anyways, we're joined today by four panelists who have been working to ask and answer questions about the forest to frame supply chain. Uh, namely, how can specifiers and projects play an active role in not only increasing transparency in the supply chain, but also customization in the supply chain that is really connecting the dots between specific forests and maybe restoration projects and the buildings that those projects um, are supplying to. So it's not only that, um, it's kind of about what the process looks like. What do those relationships look like between forest managers, wood product uh, manufacturers, design teams? Uh, and this team is really digging into that territory um, uh, in places that maybe architects traditionally weren't as involved in. So it's gonna be really interesting. Um, I think really particularly what's gonna be interesting is they've been doing the work of asking um, and attempting to answer these questions. Uh, and what that is translated to is a sort of methodology or a framework for thinking about different approaches to customizing the sourcing of wood. So we'll hear a little bit about that. We'll hear about how this framework um, ties into real world projects, namely the Ray Hall building over in the OSU Cascades campus and the PDX next new main terminal. So anyways, before we jump in, I wanna give a quick shout out to Paul Vanderford from Sustainable, Sustainable Northwest. Uh, he's one of our panelists and he really played a pretty big part in instigating this meetup. I originally asked Paul, uh, Paul for a chat about a few uh, wood innovation grant projects that he's been active on. And the conversation turned into a bigger discussion about work I didn't even know was really happening. And I'm really excited to learn more about it. So thank you to our four panelists for taking the time to join us today. And without further ado, I'm gonna hand it off to Paul who will um, give kind of a summary of what we're talking about. Excellent, I started sharing my screen as well too. Are folks seeing that or? Just yeah. Double check. Yes, okay, great. Thanks Jacob. Yeah, I'll, so I'm, Paul Vanderford, I'm the Green Markets Program Director at Sustainable Northwest. And over the last handful of years, I've been working with projects like the ones we're gonna discuss uh, as a wood advisor, providing those services um, in, a, in a variety of ways uh, to meet any you know, uh, project or client's uh, needs. And uh, first of all, I just wanna say thanks to everyone for, for joining us. I know it's a sunny day in a lot of parts of the state and <laughs> uh, I'm really excited about what we're here to talk about today. I, you know, Swinerton, ZGF, and SRG partners are as businesses, and then Erica and Jacob and Scott, specifically as individuals, are doing some really innovative work. And I don't know anyone who's going deeper on these topics than than uh, the folks who have uh, agreed to join join us today on this panel. So thank you for joining us. For uh, obviously, the individuals will um be introducing themselves here but to kind of just give a umbrella beyond what has been shared already you know we are certainly seeing a growing interest in connecting the built environment to the people and the forest that produce the fiber that goes into those projects and i think folks are starting to ask that question because they want to see how wood plays into reducing carbon footprint and i think that's most people's entry point to what we're talking about today but i think what we end up seeing as that question evolves and people mature into understanding kind of what the real opportunity is there is instead of talking about negative footprint and how to reduce it, we start to see how our buildings can have positive impacts on the people and places in our region 
and people get start to get really excited, not just about how do we do less bad, but how do we start doing some really concrete, positive things? <laughs> concrete is maybe not the right word here, but uh, you know, how do we have impacts around conservation, community, and inequity in some instances? And, and so what we're going to talk about today really is a deep dive on the pathways that projects have taken to build that relationship and some of the nuances that the different pathways represent so that people can start seeing some of the successes people are having and potentially be inspired to do it uh, on projects you're moving forward or at least being aware of, of what some of the projects that are really, you know, uh, taking this by the horns in terms of what, what we're starting to see now three years into some of these uh, processes. So uh, I know I'm taking a lot of space here, but hopefully that gives an overview as well as an introduction to, to, uh, to myself. Um, Erica, would you like to go next? Sure. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this panel. Really uh, honored to be uh, sharing the stage with Jacob, Paul, and Scott. Um, my name is Erica Spiritos. I'm the Vice President and Director of Free Construction for Timber Lab, which is Swinnerton's mass timber company. Um, we're working on a lot of really exciting projects here locally in the region and also across the country. Uh, delivering holistic mass timber systems um, that, that speak to some of these questions that Paul's uh, just described. Great, and I'll go next. So my name is Jacob Dunn. I work for ZGF Architects. I'm over in the Portland office. And you're right, Paul, it is incredibly sunny for an afternoon um, right now, which is, which is great. Um, and sort of my whole entry point into mass timber was about four years ago when I got put on the Port of Portland's um, PDX next new terminal uh, roof project. And uh, as the sustainability kind of lead for that project, I was tasked with trying to make it the most sustainable version of mass timber that it could be, which I had no idea what that was at the time. Right. So I think I kind of really relied on engaging with the supply chain and met Paul along that way and Scott and Erica, right? Swinnerton being um, the contractor that was awarded the um, design assist and, and um, partnership contract in that respect. And it's just been such a rich journey, I think, to go through and really engage around, you know, both at the forestry level, but also at the procurement level, which is really where we're gonna intersect this conversation. So um, definitely owe a lot to the, the uh, my other panelists in terms of like my educational journey and a lot of the folks that are on this call too. So really um, stoked to be here kind of speaking about what we we're able to accomplish. Well, uh, I guess I'll go last. My name is Scott Mooney. I'm with SRG Partnership. Uh, I'm a lead designer over there. Uh, my focus has been on mass timber in uh, higher education and civic projects. Um, and I was extremely excited to work with Paul on a deep dive case study into our most recent uh, mass timber project, which is OSU Cascades uh, Ray Hall. And uh, so without further ado, let's get right to it. So I think we'll just start by setting a baseline understanding of what the wood supply chain looks like for a mass timber building, because there are several degrees of separation um, from the forest to the construction site. Um, and maybe it'd be helpful to just lay that out. So we start with the trees in the forest, and those are harvested in a variety of different ways, according to all sorts of different practices by a diverse group of landowner types as well. So those timberlands are managed by public um, entities, they're managed by small family landowners, they're managed by um, tribal um, indigenous communities and by large you know, industrial corporations as well. Um, so from the forest, the, you know, the, the trees are harvested, logs are taken to a sawmill, uh, to be cut into dimensional lumber, um, often planed and kiln dried. And then from there, uh, taken to a manufacturer, also called a laminator, sometimes called a fabricator, but I think it's helpful to distinguish between manufacturing and fabrication. Um, manufacturing, I would say, is like the gluing of lumber together to make a beam or a column or a panel. And the fabrication is all that customization, the custom cutting. And sometimes that happens at the same place and sometimes it happens at different places. Um, so what we're endeavoring to do here is to understand 
every step along that supply chain um, to know the people who harvested the tree, the people who grew the tree, the people who cut the log, and the people who um, who glued the beam together, uh, and to understand the practices that um, were employed at each step of the process to support yeah, ecological stewardship in our region. All right, I think this is my slide. Oh no, this isn't my slide. This is Paul's slide. Or is it Jake's? I think it's yours. Uh, no, this, this is your Scott. Oh, this is me. Okay, great. <laughs> so why is it important? Why does this stuff matter? Um, well, and this is, uh, you know, why we're all kind of, I think, interested in wood. One of the main reasons we're interested in wood is really it, it, it connects to communities in ways that you can't get with other structural systems in terms of just directly, you know, understanding the people in the forest that produces the wood products for a building is inherently regional. Uh, it, you know, builds understanding potential to elevate the community conversation, conservation equity opportunities and align with our clients and values. And that's the kind of critical piece of the work that I think Sustainable Northwest has been helping us connect with directly. Um, and, you know, certifications, they exist in their tool, um, but they don't necessarily go as deep as we need to go to really kind of understand some of the sourcing questions that we're trying to you know, break down. Um, so this is trying to go deeper than just certification. Um, and then, you know, it can differentiate mass timber products from the Pacific Northwest and US at large from international markets um, that can typically produce products uh, due to the maturity of the master industry. And so we're just trying to kind of keep it local and go as deep locally as we can to really wrap our head around the opportunities in the Pacific Northwest around sourcing from our region. Great, and I actually just want to jump in here um, and mention one other thing that sort of is um, becoming more and more critical to some of our projects that are in the early development stage in our conversations with developers and funding resources. There's this trend going on, the sort of greening of the capital investment market to where a lot of developers or funders have ESG goals that they come to us with and they say, how are you going to help us meet our environmental, social uh, goals? And, you know, we have a sort of a framework, but in general, you have to pitch to us how you're dealing with like social equity or how you're dealing with economic impact in underserved communities or how you're dealing with carbon scope one, two, and three emissions. The people that are funding projects now that have to raise capital are asking us these questions, which is really heartening. And part of why supply chain is important, not only going back to the forest level, but even to the mills and the fabricators, you know, so we can start to understand the real economic role that our project is having, right? So we can communicate to the investors. So we can say that like, we bought this much from this glue laminator and that provided this many community jobs, right? That is part of what we have submitted as part of, you know, meeting those goals. So it's interesting that the capital market is starting to engage in this question as well. And in civic and public work, being able to tie those stories to the actual communities that you're serving is really powerful. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, Quick question, can folks see my cursor as well? I just wanna know, does anybody yeah. see a mouse? Yep, excellent, getting the thumbs up from Paul. It disappears if I don't, don't move it. But anyway, so my slide is the key challenges, right? And I think we could all speak speak to any one of these slides, right? Which is why it's sort of confusing who's, who is talking to what, but in terms of some of the key challenges that you'll hear us sort of illuminate as we go through the specific pathways of transparency by project, um, these are some of the high level takeaways, right? And probably the biggest challenge to all this is there's no one size fits all approach. We've tried it, right? We're like, okay, if we just do these three things, we can achieve transparency on a project. It's like, oh, if we could just write the perfect architectural specification, like everything would fall in line. It's like, no, absolutely not, right? We actually need to define a process of engaging and collaborating um, our team structures and with the supply chain to determine what's possible and what's feasible, right? Because it's really context-driven, very dependent on who you're talking to. So that's the first one. The second one, you know, mass timber versus lumber supply chains, as Erica mentioned before, um, with that process, all those different layers make it more and more difficult or it adds complexity to trying to track an origin, right? A lot of, of times we get this either aptly or ineptly compared to, um, you know, farm to table, where that supply chain is like this big, right? Farm to table or to restaurant, right? Versus like the mass timber supply chain is much bigger, especially when we're talking about lamb stock and engineered wood, wood products. So that's a challenge. Um, and then also the kind of lack of consistent ask from the design community, right? You know, we have these notions of, 
you know, if we were all able to make this ask more consistently, it would show that there is this demand side pool that our clients are asking us, right? That we're actually, you know, having an impact on the market to be able to know where wood comes from. I think that'll happen, but the question is how fast will it happen depending upon how organized we can be, which I think, Evan, thank you so much. And Paul, for organizing stuff like this, because this plays a big role in that, that shift as well. Um, requiring additional time and planning up front. I mean, that's a pretty, pretty big one, right? If we're trying, depending upon which level of transparency we're, we're talking about, like there's different uh, amounts of lead times that are associated with it when you have to start thinking about it. It's generally, you know, spoiler alert, much earlier than you would think, right? And sometimes that works for projects and sometimes it doesn't. Um, and that sort of like goes in with the, the next bullet. Some pathways require a lot more effort than others, right? Depending upon that context, depending on the size of the mill, the size of your project, what product types it is, what species it is, what region, all those things, you know, can play into whether it's viable or not viable. Um, and then kind of the last two are similar in terms of, you know, we know we're dealing in an industry where profit margins are razor thin, right? So asking the supply chain to do anything out of the ordinary or to be any less efficient really impacts their bottom line. So we have to be sensitive and respectful to the fact that, you know, we have to find the economic case for doing this. That's the only way it's going to be scalable. Um, and of course, inertia is probably the strongest, you know, fiscal force that, that I've encountered as a sustainability lead in just trying to get someone to do anything different, regardless of whether it's a good or bad idea, it's just really difficult in general. So with that, I think we're going to get into now how to execute. We've talked about the what is transparency, why it's important, some of the challenge, and this is the how. Yeah, thanks, Jacob. So, I mean, I would say that as much as the inertia and all the items that Jacob just brought up are, are very much true. And there's trenches that people have dug for on certain issues around forestry and, and that and that's, we recognize all of things exist. And it's easy to get to this place where you feel like that it, that there's a lot of, that a lot of it's hard. And, and I think the, the beauty of what we're talking about today is every mill, everyone we've approached with these pathways, this first pathway that, and we're gonna talk about each of these in detail, but everyone has said yes. And that I think that is because, you know, wood products, this industry is hard work and people take pride in their work. And what we're doing is we're elevating the stories that are behind the wood and we're highlighting the positive impacts and that, you know, everyone can feel good about that. And, and so this approach is inherently just asking for a relationship and building that connection. And, and everyone who grows fiber is curious where their wood goes. And everyone who's building a building has passion for the landscapes that they are pretty high up the supply chain and removed from. And so it gives the relationship back. And I think it gives that inspiration back. And so when we look at these pathways, the core piece here that we're doing is as you move from pathway one towards kind of pathway two, three, four, five, you start to see that there's more relationship required. There's more involvement of all the partners in, in the supply chain. There's trust. And then to Jacob's point, there's more time commitment. Um, and so, you know, you can get quite a few people here. You know, we've got these pathways. The first one is, is really about transparency. It's focusing on, here's a mill that, uh, here's a fabricator who we're working with directly. Here are the mills and brokers that they're buying from. And then here are the lands that that, that, that wood basket naturally represents. And so we'll go into more detail there, but that's a, that's a pretty low ask. And, and if you're gonna go and celebrate the stories that exist there, there's a lot of people willing to say yes. So I just wanted to set the foundation for this and saying that, um, you know, I think that there's a lot of yeses to be had out there. There's a lot of, you know, relationships there where people are hungry. And so I think if we start at that foundational kind of mention, there's just a lot of good work to be done. And so, uh, you know, some of these things, not everyone's going to say yes to, but I just wanted to kind of lay that to say that, that we've built it so that some of the pathways are, are pretty pretty straightforward and pretty pretty low asks and you still get a lot of value. So um, just to run through these quickly, you're gonna see that we move from a product that's not segregated where you're just asking for information to eventually a situation where you're, you're asking for material and the identity and the fiber to actually be traced in one way or another so that in some instances you can actually point at fiber installed in a building and name the forest it came from. And that is really, <laughs> amazing and if anyone's going to the mass timber conference and they're going to go tour the t-core project uh get, get ready because it's it's pretty exciting 
Um, I don't know if there's anything the team wants to mention here. We're going to deep dive on these each, so I'm trying to avoid saying too much uh, at this moment. Nope, that's a great intro, Paul. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so that's sort of the how, and then we're going to use these two case studies um, and talk about how each one of them engaged those different pathways and just a little bit of overview on the two projects we'll be hearing about today. A little preview from Paul talking about our kind of PDX new main terminal project, right? Uh, where the Port of Portland is um, our client. It's a fairly substantial project, right? A million square foot renovation. There's a new roof going over um, the existing and sort of a, a third uh, expansion out to the West. So a whole new roof, it's gonna be all mass timber, roughly 400,000 square feet. Um, and it's part of this larger program called PDX Next, which is so critical because this program is to kind of make the airport that people love even better. And that's a high bar because every time I tell someone I'm working on this project, they were like, don't mess it up, Jake. We love this airport. We love the scale. We love the materials. We love the car. We love everything about it. And, you know, you look like we've won eight out of nine titles, right? PDX has for best U.S. airport, which is pretty, pretty incredible. So there's a lot at stake, uh, but we're so excited, you know, for how it's shaping up and kind of the feedback that we've got. Um, but yeah, definitely a lot of different mass timber products and suppliers that are mixed in that that we'll talk through, you know, moving forward. Cool. Uh, OSU, Ray Hall, uh, InBend, it's for their new Cascades campus. It's intended to be a prototype for the growth of campus over time, which is actually taking over uh, abandoned pumice mine. It's actually a really cool story for a totally different presentation. <laughs> it's actually happening concurrently right now in a room up there. Um, <laughs> but uh, the exciting thing about their vision is uh, they want the campus to be net zero energy net zero water, but also um, be a full mass timber campus if they can make that happen. And so that was the task on this project was to figure out a prototype to make mass timber cost neutral and something that could be repeated for future projects as campus grows over time. Excellent. And here's just sort of an overview of some of the stuff that we're going to talk about per project in terms of you know, the materials that will be, or the systems that are go going to be featured, you know, in, in terms of with the port, right, the idea of, of really celebrating the regional mass timber economy was just a huge idea, the fact that it's the front door to the region, so really celebrating and lifting up the industries that sort of make the port exist, right, is definitely high on the priority list, and then, you know, making sure that's regionally sourced, sustainable, and then also tracked all kind of layer into this. So um, we'll get into these a little bit more, but the kind of main components are, um, you know, the sort of lattice ceiling that sort of makes up the, the main kind of bottom of the roof that you the, is the most visible and sort of closest to the occupied space. Um, there's a lot of it, right? 600,000 board feet. This has a, a, a couple of different pathways, but the forest of origin, the direct forest of origin is known for this, which is really incredible. Um, with the mass plywood diaphragm, it's going to engage in that first pathway in terms of disclosing the, the log purchasing. Um, and then of course, it's a new innovative product, uh, homegrown, right, in Oregon, that was a perfect fit for the roof in the way that we had to layer a diaphragm over this vaulted roof. It was solved a lot of technical challenges. Um, and then, of course, the glue land beams, which we'll talk about. There's 400 of these 80 foot wide glue land beams, primarily um, manufactured by Zippo, and then also a little bit by Calvert. And this has like three different pathways involved in it because there's so much there that we'll get into um, as well. Fantastic. Uh, so, our project is a little more modest, but that's okay. Yeah. Uh, that's actually the fun, you know, like how can we do this in a way that's uh, cost effective and repeatable? Um, and so we're representing three different pathways within our project. One that was in the fabrication, uh, one that is involved in the glue lamps for the columns and beams, and then the third being the cedar siding that we're using. And so a lot of this was kind of retroactively trying to understand some of the sourcing content that we're going to share today. Uh, I think the small mill direct sourcing, we knew how to do that on the outset and be intentional around the sourcing for that scope. But for the actual mass timber components. Um, that's where we really wanted to kind of unpack the process. And that's where we work with Sustainable Northwest. Excellent. So now jumping into each pathway. So I just want to say that I did not draw these. Jacob is way better at drawing these diagrams. And I just have a, <laughs> I want to say thanks to Jacob for doing these. Uh, so as you can see here, there's just 
kind of an example of four different forests. A lot of mills are gonna have more than four forests they're sourcing from, but just to get an idea of, of, of this pathway really just showing here are the forests that during the production cycle or relevant period of time uh, that, that the logs that came into the facility and you know, here's the commingled log deck, no segregation. Here's logs pulled, uh, and and here's product that came out the other side that obviously represents a mix of different grades and 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 product lines, and the ones that were relevant to the project being pulled and, and shipped to the project the way that a, a normal uh, mill operation would would be doing business. And so there's really no change here other than the mill says yes, I recognize that the fabricator bought fiber from me, and I've committed to the project that I'm I'm willing to share this pie chart of where I got my product. And in some instances, naming uh, forest owners as well as counties, uh, as well as ownership type in terms of kind of large private, small private, family owned, um, you know, federal, state, tribally owned. And so you start to get this idea of of the different vendors involved in in the fiber that you're buying. Just throw out one thing too. I think one of the challenges really of this too is that you know one CLT manufacturer, glue lamb manufacturer this might only be one portion of their supply, right? This is a really simplified example of, let's just say it all comes from one source, but we know that there are much more complexities behind this. Sometimes you're buying from multiple mills. Sometimes you're buying from a broker, right? Sometimes you're buying from a mill that's buying from another mill, right, in that respect. So we know that it's not quite as clean, but this just represents that proof of concept of how simple of an ask it can be, right? Just where did this where did this come from? And then as Paul mentioned, really what timeline is critical? And then are we talking about landowners identifying them specifically or talking a little bit about the landowner type and potentially a geographical location? Um, definitely interesting. So then moving into uh, the Ray Hall example of how I executed this pathway. Yeah, so um, this is something that we worked really closely with Paul on to um, really connect the dots between some of the forest restoration projects that in the Colville National Forest that Sustainable Northwest has been um, intimately involved in facilitating and seeing the quantity of logs from those forest restoration projects, which are active thinning projects for wildfire mitigation, forest health. Um, they exist outside of the FSC certification path because they're coming from federal forests, but they're doing really important work for the forest that in terms of forest health and, and wildfire mitigation. And so understanding how that source, those logs went to the mill. And so the mill that was sourcing from those projects is the Wagen Brothers Lumber, which is separate from Wagen Brothers CLT. And that's, that's an important distinction. Um, and Eric is kind of speaking to that earlier a little bit, but you know, there's a strong relationship between the forestry practices and the mills and the proximity, the physical proximity. That relationship is less important in terms of the location of the mill relative to the manufacturer or fabricator because you can pack those trucks much much more efficiently once you've actually sawn down all of the members um, and so what you're seeing here is just a percentage of the wood that that went into the clt in this case and we really looked at the log purchase transparency understanding the percentage of the overall mix that we were getting and something else to note is that percentage changes um, relative to the products that you're specifying. So for example, you may have a, more, a higher likelihood of having forest restoration wood in a stress rated three ply panel as opposed to a five ply panel, five ply panel because of how they grade the lumber and the way that some of the forest restoration logs are denser. So there's, there's a lot of nuance to it, um, but that's the process we used for tracking the CLT sourcing. Great. And then on the other side of the spectrum, um, this is just a diagram that sort of shows a little bit about the glue lamb um, extent, right, in terms of like what does 2 million board feet of 2 bias look like? What does 400, um, 400 uh, glue lamb beams look like? This is sort of a good animation. Then how do you build it, right, which is Swinerton and Hoffman Scanskip and working together on like being prefabricated next to the airport so it can be moved over to reduce the disruption to the airport as much as possible. Um, but this is just a good overview of the scale of that, that project. And here's just a construction photo of what these curved glue lambs look like. You said two by eight um, lamb stock, two million board feet. They're an 80 foot span from girder to girder. They're roughly four feet 
deep in the middle and they kind of get to six feet deep as they come into the, the different girders. Um, that's just a little bit of yield review. And now in terms of the sourcing, this chart sort of talks a little bit about the glue lambs and the, the lattice. The lattice we'll talk about later, just didn't separate it for, the, for this particular presentation. But for instance, you know, when we look at 2 million board feet in the, um, in the glue lambs, when we look at where did that come from, right? There's a certain amount of it was unsegregated. So we used an FSC claim from a sustainability standpoint, um, but this started to engage in that log purchasing uh, transparency and made this while ago, back in the day, we're calling it mill input reporting, but we like log uh, reporting transparency. It's all so new, right? This is all stuff that we're trying to figure out ways to standardize an approach, as Scott had mentioned, so we can make this more replicable in general. Um, but so a uh, big portion of this, you know, the pathway one was attempting, and then there was a certain portion that we were able to do direct sourcing, which we'll get into down the road. Um, in terms of where that came from, in this case, there were sort of two main sources for land stock. Frank Lumber provided a lion's share, I think roughly 1.3 million board feet for, for this piece, and Zippo around uh, 350K. And uh, Zippo provided that log purchasing transparency, right? So we asked Zippo, okay, during this, the production run when you were pulling land stock, you know, what was your log deck composition for that production period? And they came back with this pie chart that was like, okay, here's who we sourced from during that time. So ostensibly this is where our wood was coming from, right? Or could have came from, if, you know, because it's all sort of blended and mixed up and we can start to look at, there's two different mills, right? They're purchasing some private, right? There's the OSU research forests, which is pretty cool, right? Anytime we're sort of supporting these university kind of research educational forests, it's sort of an interesting story. Um, we haven't had a chance to really dive into the sources here because we just got this information, but this represents going to a mill, then providing that, um, just a simple spreadsheet, right, in, in that respect, and we could start to have conversations about what this means in general. Um, and then Frank Lumber is working on some version of this as well, too, right, in general, so we'll sort of see what comes of that, but like we're hoping that for this chunk that we will have that where it could have came from through just the log um, log purchasing transparency. Additionally, the um, mass plywood diaphragm also falls into this pathway. The log purchase transparency, this is what that looks like. So roughly 400,000 square feet. I think it's like 700,000 board feet when once we take all the chops out and look at the actual volumes. But like I said before, this was a perfect material to use to drape over these kind of um, uh, different geometric vaults and domes that the roof was made up. So it was a perfect material for that. And then upon you know, engaging with Ferris, they were um, really um, engaged in wanting to tell the story of just where they source their logs from, right? They're proud of where that is. There's a lot of good sources that are within that. So they're like, yeah, we would love to share this data with you, right? In general, we have this data. You know, they were really great about working with like, how do you want it broken out? Do you want it by county? Do you want it by landowner type? Right now, it's all just by landowner type, and we're sort of identifying maybe who you know we can name specifically, but it's taking that little bit of engagement. I think that's an open question with this process, right? We have to be very careful about, hey, can we show this data? Are the landowners okay with showing the data? They do, do they want to be linked to this project? Like the kind of question of disclosure is something that we all need to work on and also uh, standardize as we move through this. So we're just generally super careful. But yeah, this is sort of a unique year for first as well, talking with them about the, the log sourcing just because of you know, COVID and the wildfires, right, were a big part of, of this particular supply chain. They were hit pretty hard their region, right? So that conversation is now possible in terms of how much of that supply chain, you know, had um, salvage um, logs in it and then how much came from your own lands, which, you know, Ferris knows a lot of information and have shared about like their own practices versus how much is coming from state or federal land, which federal harvests were they? So in theory, we can now go to the publicly available data and and determine, you know, for this 6%, right, which forest did that come from? And talk a little bit about their practices and determine if they were supported by local collaboratives or what ecological principles um, they were they were utilizing in their, their treatments, right? All of that is possible because they were willing to engage around just the, where did you buy this these logs from as they made their way through two different phases, plywood and then mass plywood for the supply chain. So uh, that was fantastic to, to get that information um, for the mass plywood as well. Yeah, thanks for those um, overviews. 
Uh, so I'll share with you just some lessons learned and some opportunities for scalability from contractor or builder's perspective. Um, as Paul mentioned earlier, pathway one really is meant to be this baseline that should be achievable for all projects, um, but it is still uh, new. It's still new. And so there, you know, it's always helpful when embarking on new endeavors or initiatives to have trusting relationships with the people that you're working with, especially in an industry that is so rooted in um, just their, 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 their ways, their ways of operating. And many of these mills are, you know, family run businesses that have been um, doing their thing for generations and are used to kind of plugging away at their own, um, in, you know, in their, according to their own processes and even, even asking for a little bit of transparency with a request to share their log sources might be perceived um, at, might, might be, you know, challenging to some people. Um, I think one, one kind of interesting tidbit there is that uh, often these, these mills are competing against each other for the logs, right? And so and when, a, when a timber sale goes up, you know, out for a bid, um, a number of these mills come together, you know, come kind of converge on that opportunity and one mill wins out. And um, sometimes there's an opportunity to maybe avoid a timber sale altogether with a relationship between a, a landowner and a, and a mill. Um, and then you kind of avoid that, you circumvent that, that auction process. Um, but you know, it's almost like giving away a secret recipe, I imagine, like there might be some reluctance on behalf of the mill to share, like, to share the secret recipe. Because um, the, like the logs, the raw ingredients for their product, right. And for many of the mills, they're really focused on quality, especially lamb stock mills, it's quality over volume. And the log is what, you know, just like, can't make a good tomato sauce without a good tomato, right. Um, to use that farm to table analogy. So, so I'll just leave you with that. But I do think there is opportunity to scale this. I think we can specify that laminators provide this data as a submittal during the procurement phase. Um, but I, I do just want to encourage everyone to, to go, you know, meet, meet the mills um, and, and develop those relationships. Yeah, I want to throw out one challenge with this too is that even though like in theory it can be replicated right with just the right specification um that's sort of in in line right with the product type um and potentially a reporting template it still has to change a lot of hands and the intent has to get communicated pretty well right in terms of we wrote a spec for t core right we had to give that spec to hoffman skanska hoffman skanska had to then communicate that spec to Swinerton, although we were all in the same meeting, right, because of the collaborative process. But in theory, right, it would go downstream to Swinerton. Swinerton would then have to give that to a fabricator, and the fabricator would then have to communicate that to the mills, right, and the sources. So there's like four steps there that if we have a spec and a reporting template, that intent has to get communicated all the way down the chain without it scaring one any off for bidding, right? So like that's a challenge too. So like that's why this process of engagement you know, having more of a collaborative integrated team, having Paul there, right, to help facilitate those conversations um, is fantastic, right? Because it allows everyone to get on board. But in terms of the scalability, I think that's one challenge, but there should be a fairly, you know, easy pathway to try to make this more replicable. Yeah, and maybe I'll just add the relationship comes from like in-person, you know, just time together. Like Paul and I went down to Frank Lumber and we sat with them for a while. And, you know, it took it took, it took some time to get them comfortable with yeah. sharing this information. It wasn't, you know, and I remember them saying like, you're really lucky. I can't believe they're giving you, you know, <laughs> so just a little bit of that. Um, yep. Well, Paul, did you want to mention That's something good. here? I'm just aware of the timing and I think some of the stuff we're still trying to cover moving forward is probably equally as important as. Uh, so this, yeah. the second pathway here is, is recognizing that there are some mills that naturally are aligned where the, where a large volume of their fiber comes from one forest. Um, there's a couple different scenarios where that plays out, but when you have a mill that's connected to a forest that your client, uh, you know, wants to engage with, then this this pathway becomes 
kind of additive to the to the first concept, which is you're approaching a mill. They're not necessarily segregating something out, but they naturally have a product coming from a particular forest that you're interested in. Um, the Yakima Forest Products is a kind of clear case in point on, on, on this vertically integrated um, mill scenario. And you will see that there's kind of this forest D in the diagram, and that's to recognize that there are very few mills where 100% of the fiber is going to come from one source. There may be some uh, mills in Canada because of, of crown lands and things like that. But in the United States, um, it, it would be very rare. So this kind of vertical integration allows you to, to get a lot of this transparency in relationship to primary you know, forest of origin without um, more than just you know, being intentional about who you're selecting for your, for your supply. All right, so can everyone hear me? Okay, I just turned up my mic a little bit and I'll project yep, a little more. Can. Sorry for the sound issues earlier. So this is speaking directly to the Paul's point around, uh, you know, in this example, tribally sourced wood. So the difference between the last diagram you saw, which was the kind of outline around the publicly owned land with the private mill directly adjacent to it. This is a privately owned mill on privately owned land so that that supply chain, that connection between the forest and where the wood is getting milled down uh, is extremely direct. And so that means that in terms of the basket, in terms of what percentage of that mix is coming from that land, it's a lot easier to pin down than it is when you have these private mills that have purchases that come from all over the place. Um, and you know, something else to note is in Zippo who, oh, you can go to the next one. Uh, Zippo, who laminated uh, the beams and columns for this project, is not very close to the um, kind of you know the source. I guess you could say uh, it's it's not like the Vaughan CLT plant, which is next door to the Vaughan mill. Uh, you know, Zippo's in Eugene, Yakima is all the way up in kind of south central Washington, and so this is where you know depending on the component and the fabricator. Um, you might be able to think a little further afield in terms of if you're trying to target particular forests or sources for the wood you're using uh, on the manufacturer side. Uh, one other quick note here too, you know, with um, Zippo, I think both with this project, definitely with um, TCOR, is that they understood sort of the criteria and the sourcing goals from the port, and they were definitely fantastic to work with in terms of like, okay, yeah, well, we'll call these sources then and be on, be aware of sort of their harvest schedules and like when we should be calling these folks to see if we can get more of their product into your project, right? So, I mean, they were fantastic in terms of like being part of the, the process, understanding that criteria and helping us identify opportunities based upon, like in our case, wanting to incorporate as much tribal wood into the project as possible, which is a common criteria, right? That we're seeing in general. And, and so that just speaks to the importance of having these conversations as early as humanly possible, because then you're trying to sync your construction schedule with the cycles of harvest from these different forest stands. Yeah. And I think, you know, to some degree, we got lucky as well, because we were doing all of this right for the first time, you know, similarly, I think with Ray Hall, right. And like we, we landed into some like decent harvest windows that worked. Question is like, is there a way that we can like increase that? percentage more if we could plan for it, right? And if there was a way to, to better understand harvest schedules and be able to dial that up a little bit, it's sort of an interesting question moving forward. Um, one, speaking of interesting questions moving forward, I wanna just do a time check. Evan, we have till 5.30, right? Paul's comment really scared me. Yeah, or do we yeah have no, you got till 5.30. Okay. okay, good. Yeah, and we're gonna to try to leave lots of time at the end for discussion, but yeah, just wanted to make sure that we, that we do indeed That's have great. that. We are on path two of six, though, so there's definitely more, more pathways coming. Um, so we had a very similar um, process with utilizing Zippo for the glue lamb beams and then having there be a certain mix of wood um, from, from Yakima uh, Nation as well. And in this case, we also ended up um, being able to work with Swinerton to be able to do that direct segregation uh, for a component that Paul mentioned to where there are certain beams that we can look up. So it's not a blend, but there are certain beams we can point up to and say that this came from the Yakima mill. And for us, that's these um, kind of uh, ridge beams that are in these skylights that kind of crown the giant steel Y columns, you know, throughout the airport, there's like 32 of these 
right? And then on each one of those um, columns, there's this giant, you know, skylight, and then it has wood framing on the top. And you can see that beam, you know, when you're standing below, and you can point up and say that that came from, from Yakima. And that was all just because we were able to have that vertically integrated story. And then Swinnerton was able to integrate that into the production schedule to say, hey, we'll do all of Skylight A's during this time now that we have Yakima's wood. We'll make sure we segregate that into our process, and make sure all of these ridge beams we can point up and say came from Yakima Nation, which was pretty interesting. It's also um, you know, cool to note that like using travel wood was a huge priority. You know, Yakima provided roughly 370,000 board feet to the project from their mill. They were the single largest landowner that contributed to any of the wood for both the, the um, uh, blue land beams and then also the lattice. So roughly 15% of the blue land beams, which was, which was great. But all right, lessons learned. Yeah, couple, a couple lessons learned on, on the vertically integrated approach, pathway two, as we're calling it. Um, so, you know, what we're talking about here is transparency and also, you know, customization or targeting certain ecologically progressive or, or just, just forests that are doing good, good, good for the ecosystem. So, um, transparency doesn't always imply ecological stewardship. Um, I think there is an overlap though. Um, and I just think it's important for people to to be conscious that just because you know where the wood is coming from doesn't mean that it's coming from a place that would make us all proud. So it's still important to read forest management plans. Um, and then the next point is just still important to understand what percentage of the wood is coming from that vertically integrated source versus from an external source. Um, I think this, this, you know, the option, the opportunities to scale this pathway uh, are tied to the number of vertically integrated you know, entities in, in the region, in the country, right? And not all um, operations are vertically integrated, although there are, there are a few here and, and some of them are represented on this call. Um, Zippo, I think I saw Mitch from Kolesnikov um, and obviously Freres. Um, so, so yeah, I think there are opportunities, but if you are focused on this approach, you do limit your procurement flexibility to a degree. Um, and then also important to say that um, there are different degrees of vertical integration. So um, you could be integrated from the you know, laminator to the mill, you could be integrated from the laminator mill back to the forest or just the mill to the forest and then have a different laminator. Um, so all those are just nuances that we want to pay attention to. Um, but the baseline kind of understanding that we have is that any degree of kind of um, vertical integration helps in eliminating one step in that chain where that communicate, where that goal needs to be kind of passed down. Um, yeah, I want to mention just, you know, one thing that's really nice about the vertical integration and having so much come from, you know, that mills timberlands is that it's really easy to understand the forest practices, as Erica mentioned, right? Like Yakima, X amount came from Yakima, X amount they bought from their own timberland. They know how they're managing. It's a really easy point of research. Ferreras is the same way, right? You know, providing stuff from their lands and they provided information around like log distribution in the past of the uh, age groups, right? So like we can make a claim or in theory we could, if we dug into it, make a claim around um, uh, rotation age, right? In that respect. Um, so all of that is, is possible and it's just much easier to make a claim of more volume, right? If you're sourcing from a vertically integrated mill. One note too on specification. So in theory, this could be handled with the specification. But let me just illustrate an example of like why it's so difficult, right, to do anything like definitively. So like if I'm a project and I want to say, well, I want, I love the Yakima story. I want, you know, 100% of my blue lambs to come from Yakima Nation. So I'm going to write the spec has 100% has to be from tribal wood from a vertically integrated mill from Yakima Nation. If you haven't talked to Yakima first or even potential fabricators like Zippo, they will even do that. And they're like, well, they don't even have, they're not even planning on cutting that much lamb stock in all of, you know, 2023. And even then they're not going to give it all to one supplier, right? So that's why first it's worth it to understand the landscape of what is available to say, it's like, well, maybe, you know, 25% might be something that's more reasonable. And even then the way that we wrote it into our specifications were minimum thresholds. So we're saying that at least X percent has to be from tribal entities. That gives 
the fabricators and the contractors and the uh, mills a lot of flexibility in meeting those without you being overly prescriptive and forcing them into a corner that's not even realistic. That conversation is so critical in determining what's feasible. And, and I think that's the role that Paul and Sustainable Northwest can play is helping facilitate the sort of project goals with what actually can be achieved and helping connect the dots between and build those relationships. Like, you know, it's, it'd be tough for us to cold call some of these folks without, you know, having all there as a facilitator, as that kind of link to those communities. I would add that for these early projects that are kind of leading on this, you know, there's instances where a client maybe resonates with a particular goal, like connecting to small family forest operators, but we don't know how much of that fiber is really getting into the supply chain that we're most interested in connecting to. And so there was work we did where we actually went and, you know, engaged 20, 30 small family forest operators to understand, you know, are you cutting this year? How much volume? What species in grade? Who do you sell to? So that we could get a handle of some of that as we went into the RFP process. So we weren't asking for more than we knew was, was possible. Um, and we knew that the vendors that we were buying from were in the wood baskets of the people we were talking to. And so I, that, that level of detail is, is probably not going to be needed indefinitely. But for some of these early projects, we really wanted to make sure we weren't asking for something that was not possible. Great point. So for um, this pathway, I think you start to see uh, segregation as, as a question. And, and I think the important piece here is to really just ask a mill where they're at and what they're willing to do. This isn't a, um, a question where somebody, I think you would be into a lot of trouble if you just started a conversation saying, we want you to segregate product for this project. But, but I think what you're seeing here is the, the kind of word temporal is, is to signify that, that a, a, if a mill has a fiber source that resonates with your client and they have enough of a log deck that you know, there's, there's kind of a cost associated with building up a segregated log deck, but that's a different cost than actually running a batch process and or skewing from a standard cutting um, window where you're just, you know, you're, you're cutting what the market's paying the most for and what the log can, can best create versus batching a product to skew towards something that, 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 that disproportionately produces a grade and a size that's for a particular project. And so what's meant by this slide is to say, you know, you, you, this pathway is that you can work with mills to say, can you build up a log deck sufficient that you could run it for a window of time and then pull fiber that's coming at a, at a grade and a need for this project during that normal production window. And so there's more of a buy-in and more of a commitment from the mill in this situation, but it's not asking for clearing the lines because obviously that's a very high cost for particularly high production mills. Um, and, and where you start to see more successes with some of these segregated products is when you have a cutting mill that maybe, have, you know, mills like some of like what Zippo is doing and what some of the beam providers are doing, where there's the, where they aren't going after that just kind of high volume commodity grade, you're going to start finding success when you're when you're trying to find products from from mills that have have more of that cutting focus. And so I know that's a slight nuance. You could probably find success across the board if you had the right relationship, but you start to see where there's some dead ends as you when you start moving towards segregation. I know that's that's kind of a, a, a non-starter for some operations. If only we had a diagram to communicate that difference, which we do. Spoiler preview that's coming up, but um, absolutely that's a great overview. We've got a question in the chat real quick um, from Joe Mayo. It's probably worth us keeping in mind as we talk about it. It's um, how much time is needed to find what supply is available in order to write an achievable specification. How early in the design process does this conversation need to start? Depends on the pathways, the short answer, but I'll let Paul answer that one for, let's talk about that first for um, maybe just, well, I guess segregation is, is sort of when you'd want to target, right? So do you have a sense, Paul? Now we've talked about rough rules of thumb. Yeah, I think, months. I think that the, depending on the region that you're sourcing from, some regions have organizations that are already serving certain land ownership classes. And so if you're in an area where somebody like Northwest Natural Resources Group exists or some of these other vendors who have, you know, hundreds of thousands of forests, there's hundreds of thousands of acres of forest land across hundreds of 
of landowners, then you can kind of go to one place and start pulling information. Uh, you know, I think that we don't want to do that across the market, kind of asking those questions all the time. But I think there are places you can go to ask that information and get it more quickly because they're acting as a middle person or a vendor that then helps to set up the, the harvest and the sales. And so they have a, a pretty good read across a large landscape. If you're in an area where uh, an operation like that doesn't exist, then I think you need to find somebody who's going to be a wood advisor capable of going and engaging with with those landowners and depending on how much of their time um, there is, you know, I think you could do that work in a matter of uh, probably a month if somebody really had the time to commit to it. But, you know, putting the ask out and kind of socializing it so people understand why the heck you're asking the question in the first place, um, you know, and that goes back to relationship. If you have trust, a lot of the details become less important and people are just willing to give you information. And if you're new to the area and you don't have that relationship, you don't have the trust, then that time frame is going to balloon. So I'd say somewhere between a month and probably six months. Great. And uh, so we were able to achieve this particular pathway for uh, a couple of different products in the airport, which we're really excited about. The main one being the lattice, right? So going back to what I was talking about earlier, this is the ceiling product. It's a three by six timber, roughly 10 to 12 feet for the most part. 100% um, of this can be traced back specifically to the, I think there are 10 different landowners that contributed to it. We know exactly what volumes they contributed because of segregation and then also path five, which we'll get to. 100% um, was sustainably harvested at the source. So the source forest met our criteria for sustainability, which could be its own hour long presentation. 100% um, was also FSC certified. So we sort of used both claims in this case because this was such an important part of the story. Um, and then, yeah, the, the traceability back to the origin was from um, Mankey Lumber, and they were willing to do log deck segregation from sources that met our criteria, and then they were able to run that all at the same time and just pull the two by eight lamb stock out at a reasonable pace, right? We didn't incur any penalty for, for batch processing, um, but it allowed us, you know, 500,000 board feet. This was done for timbers, though, going back to one of those challenges not lamb stock, right? But this was for timber, so it was a little bit more straightforward. But the fact that, you know, we got a medium medium to large size mill, depending upon your scale, to do segregation from sources to where they even targeted certain sources like Skokomish because they knew that was one of our, our criteria, I think is incredible. It represents sort of like one of the ways that this could go in the future and have it be replicable and scalable. So we have, you know, a lot to, to making crew for figuring this out, for working with us and being engaged just like Zippo was in terms of actually actively trying to meet that criteria. Um, makes sense, right, for the airport, for other projects, hopefully they would do it if it's easier, right, which is why it's like this pathway is designed to try to like show that this is possible. Now our task is going to be how to make this easier for the next projects, how to make it more replicable, scalable, um, just so there's less logistics and, and troubleshooting right uh, down the supply chain. But this is just an image of a couple of the different pieces of lattice. Here's how that works out, you know, as we're tracking it through, um, you know, X amounts certified, X amount is direct sourced with um, sustainable sourcing at the, the piece. Um, but the real exciting part of this, and this is all on the, the PDX Next website, if you want to learn a little bit more about some of the landowners behind this, uh, a lot of the other landowners will be talked about as they roll out their PR strategy later this year. These are the ones that are on the website right now. But this is you know, one that was really um, inspirational in terms of we actually had a chance to go out to the Skokomish Forest and learn about their forest restoration that was happening on their land, right? This is Jal from NNRG down there on the bottom. And uh, it was incredible because this image here was sort of the first harvest site. So like these stumps that you can see in this thinned forest directly fed into the lattice. So that was just pretty cool to connect our client to the forest, you know, the trees that made it into their, um, into, into their project. And we got to learn a little bit about what kind of a more single tree selection forest restoration uh, piece looked like, which probably represents like the best side of the spectrum of ecological forestry. Not all forestry can be this, right? But it was interesting to get some of this into our project. You know, so this image in that bottom left was harvested. And I remember showing up on site and being like, okay, where's the harvest site? Jaws like, while well, you're looking at it. And so then you started to notice these stumps, you know, that, that, that were missing. And these are skid trails that are like organically, you know, meandering through the forest to cut down on erosion. But this is as bad as it looks for the most part, right? So it was interesting to kind of 
experience that side of forestry in terms of like what that impact could look like um, in you know a tribal forest that's being managed for certain cultural and habitat values. Um, and we got to uh, interview Tom Strong on site, right, about what he wants the project to know about the Skokomish tribe and their kind of community connection and, and you know how they kind of care for their intergenerational um, movements. I mean, it was just it was incredible. There's there's more on the website too to check out. Also, we went from the west side over to the east side, which was really interesting, to uh, one of the Nature Conservancy's forests out there in Clay Ellum, where we got to learn firsthand about like reintroducing fire in the landscape and looking at a forest that was being restored, particularly for dry side um, wildfire resilience. And to kind of learn about the connection between that and kind of Rosslyn and, and a couple of the other rural you know, towns that were out there and the kind of connection to a recreation economy that this was helping to support was just really incredible. Um, and then also got to learn too about just the differences between restoration on west side and east side forests. And so uh, I think you know one thing that's really great about this too is that we can link our project directly to something that's helping to mitigate forest fires, right? Which everyone hates, right? You know, especially, you know, connecting the, the rural economies and the urban economies to be able to say that we are actively supporting forestry that is meant to reduce wildfire risk has been really positive um, reactions. We got to like talk to Herman about like, why did he join TNC? He'd been a forester for two years and kind of getting the story of like what he does day to day and how he managed this, pro this project was pretty incredible too. But okay, and then this is a, uh, <clears throat> the challenges slide. Thanks. Um, yep. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, this, this pathway feels a little bit um, like you're looking for just the right mill to me. Um, and so it feels like maybe the least scalable, which is why you see the question mark there on the right. Um, so, Yes, given the luxury of time, a large mill that is, you know, amenable to the cause and, you know, uh, on board with the cause can, can collect targeted logs, um, collect the lumber on the back end uh, without needing to run a separate process. And, you know, the, the mill that supported this effort, Mankey, um, feels like a hidden gem to me um, in some ways. And so, you know, I say that because when I speak to some of the primary manufacturers and laminators in the region, I didn't hear any of them really say they were sourcing lamb stock from Mankey. And so while Mankey is willing to make lamb stock, they're not, um, they're not one of the mills that's contributing to the mass timber um, projects that we're working on. Um, so the lattice was, you know, a separate, a separate thing, uh, and it's possible that in the future this, this is scalable. Um, but uh, and maybe, maybe um, Jacob, you have or Paul, you have some additional thoughts on this pathway. But I do think that this, this feels like, um, kind of, this feels like a hidden gem that is. It's worth asking all the mills because because theoretically doing this temporal process, batch processing is less of a heavy lift or less disruptive to a mill's, you know, overall kind of production line than the batch processing at one time. Um, yeah, I, I think it depends, right? It's such a new ask that most people are going to be like, why would I do this, right? So it's, you know, going back to the process of engagement and then certain mills are set. It's intensive too. I mean, because you're asking yeah. them to keep material on their site for a long time. Absolutely. And, and some mills are set up to do this better than others. Going back to the point of like figuring out which scales of mills are who's willing to do what. That was Paul's point, right? And then also the, the size of the ask too. So, you know, is it how much board footage is it? Um, are they already set up to do, like some bills do more segregated decks than others in general too. So it's a lot of, of that engagement early on, but without like the understanding of the why, which in this case was really to optimize the sourcing or to be able to, you know, um, help target some of these um, tribal sources like that we were trying to go after, right? There's not really much reason to do it other than to kind of have that particular story, but it is is new and uh, definitely for Lampstock it's more challenging. So I think that's a big question mark moving forward is how replicable can this particular pathway be specifically for uh, engineered wood products. 
Excellent. Paul or Scott, any thoughts on this before we move on? Uh, I think your comment about it being challenging for engineered wood products is a good segue to the next one. Yeah. Excellent. There we go. So Paul, you already covered this. So I'm just gonna kind of pass over it just so we can try to get to more discussion. Um, but as Paul mentioned, right, either you segregate and then you pull products slowly over time, or you have to do a custom cutter batch run, which sort of makes it, takes it to a whole new level of intensity. And it's interesting because that's what happened um, with us, right, in terms of one of our kind of product pathways um, with Zippo. And so with Zippo, similarly, you know, they understood the kind of desire to have tribal sourcing in the project, and then specifically for organ tribal sourcing, as you can imagine. Um, in this case. So Coquel was one of the, the targets that we had done some research on. We knew they had harvests that were coming up to be a part of this. So we were like, can we make that happen? And um, at some point, it was incredible because this was the plan, was that we would go out, we would um, either get a direct sale or we ended up having to do, uh, go. Up. the harvest had to go out to a timber auction because of um, some changes to their uh, overall procurement structure, which I'll get into in a minute. Um, so we had to go out, bid on the project, hopefully we we're going to win it. And then, you know, this would go to Zippo log mill. And it was going to be such a large amount of wood is that it was going to be pretty easy to segregate the log deck. And then Zippo would just pull out the lamp stock slowly over time and use those for some of the glue lamps in the project, right? That was going to be path of sort of low resistance, I'm not going to say least resistance, right, but it seemed feasible, right, enough to where that was the original plan. Um, so as I mentioned, it was so much like fun, honestly, to go out with Zippo, you know, we went on a timber cruise with them, we went and met with, uh, you know, Coquel um, tribal leaders, they took us around to these two different forests, you know, and we got to like, take Zippo's log buyer and be like, does this make sense? Do you think this is going to work? And, you know, to start that process, it was like one of the most fun events that I've ever been on, you know, full disclosure, um, just to be walking around with them talking about, you know, the harvest and, and what this meant. And, you know, it represented a really high level of forest conservation as well. This is on the, the higher kind of more productive side of forestry. Uh, but in this case, it's still really ecologically focused. It's like a 40 acre opening, 15% retention, which is really high for that size of opening. They're FSC certified, right? So it comes with you know, a whole bunch of other types of ecological stewardship aspects of that. Um, but we really you know, love the forestry and the fact that it was coming from an Oregon tribe. Um, and then also they were the first federally recognized forest to, to undergo um, a program through um, the, the US to get more sovereignty in terms of how they control and manage their lands. And this was the first harvest that was part of that new structure. It's one reason why they had to go out to bid as well too, but just so much wrapped up into this one forest, stewardship, targeting, right? You know, equity, it, it was incredible. Um, so what we ended up having to do um, was to do this segregation, but as a batch process because we lost the timber sale, which is heartbreaking. Remember that, that phone call, um, but luckily, the log sale did go to um, Herbert Lumber and Zippo had a good enough relationship with them or a great relationship to where they worked out to where they could just buy the amount of logs they needed for 30,000 board feet, not very much, right? Just generally a small amount and then do a custom cutter batch run um, to create the two byte lamb stock that would go into the beams that I'm gonna show you on the next slide. And that took a lot of logistics for a small amount of wood. So we paid you know, a hefty premium for that but the port was so committed to having that wood in the project to be able to um, represent that piece as part of the sourcing that it was worth that headache. But it was great because, you know, to Erica's point, low resistance, high resistance, right? In terms of uh, the circumstance, the level of, of planning or the amount of time it took to execute this is really what made us have to switch this gear and do it sort of the hard way. But I think it, you know, it was definitely worth it looking back, at least on, on our side of the ports, really happy with it because despite the premium, you know, all of these um, double glue lambs and six of these oval skylights in the airport, these all are the recomposure skylights. So it's after you go through security, you know, you're kind of putting your shoes back on. We've got these circular tree benches with these trees that sort of extend up and will be under this skylight that we can point up to and say this, you know, directly came from uh, the Coquel tribe. And, you know, here's the story of that harvest, right, which I kind of fumbled through a little bit before, but um, definitely one of those direct component segregation stories that was possible because Zippo was so willing to work with us 
around that plan A and plan B around segregation. So, you know, to Erica's point, we did have one mill at least that was willing to do a long-term temporal segregation that was actually from a logistic standpoint, not that difficult to do. But Casey, you're on here as well. So please let me know if I'm misrepresenting anything around this no. particular piece. No, I just, uh, you, you did great, Jake. And this, and Kelsey's in the woods with you too. Um, but yeah, no, it, 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 we, we had our best laid plans and it didn't work out, but I'm glad you guys still wanted to pursue it. And we still just want to try and make it work. And uh, it was really cool. Cause that's when um, Paul had the film crew come over to do the video at the sawmill. And, and those are the logs going through when, uh, when they were filming. So we were able to schedule that together just so now it's going to be just a part of uh filmography forever <laughs> so fantastic yeah pretty incredible that we have like footage of the logs being transported right to the mill we have images of like the timber crews right when we were there together mm -hmm. and then that final kind of link right in the end to where it's you know in the airport and can be traced back to that supply chain right. if folks have looked at any of the zippo uh, videos in the link that was shared at the beginning of the call, the, the logs in that video are the Coquel logs. So that was pretty neat. And Casey's team really uh, exhibited some strong partnership there in making that possible. <laughs> hey, it, 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 it's gone both ways to this whole project. Uh, Paul, you hit it on the head, uh, just saying that with Swinnerton and being open with the vendors um, and communication between everybody. Uh, that's what's made this project go is having that kind of relationship, just like you're saying. So I 100% agree. Excellent. Um, so I'll start by saying that for large mills, the batch processing is inherently inefficient. Um, you know, they just want to keep their um, their operation flowing. Uh, they're focused on high volume and to stop and kind of move to a separate project, um, which may be, you know, even just a couple hours of their operation uh, takes time away from their, from their flow of work and will reduce their output for the day uh, and or, or however many days it takes to do the batch run. Um, and so there, there will likely be a fee associated with that or cost premium for that. Um, because the, uh, because the, this pathway is really focused, not just on transparency, but on targeting specific forests, this pathway requires like the most amount of time, um, to target those forests, uh, to understand who's doing harvest when, um, to do the assessment of whether those trees meet the, uh, strength requirements for the project, the grade requirements, um, and then to understand if the forest is managing the land um, to the level of stewardship that um, is, you know, being specified. Um, and so there's just, there's a, this is time intensive. And, you know, as Paul, you said six months earlier, but I think we started this work like two years before. <laughs> I would agree with that. Oh, Erica. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, I think you didn't want to scare anyone away. And probably, you know, all that work that we did in those, you know, kind of first 18 months or so, like, um, made it possible for us to do this project on such a large scale. For a smaller scale project, it probably would only take six months. And now we just all collectively know a lot more about the process and how it would work. Um, but it still takes extra time. Um, and then, and then, you know, as Jake mentioned, you might still lose the timber sale. Right? Um, right, so you have to account for that, and that's why specifying specific forests um, is challenging and, and not advisable. Um, and rather, it's helpful to specify a type of forest, landowner type, or a kind of management type, and then, as Jake said, a minimum threshold requirement. Um, I think that's really helpful. Uh, and then I will just mention that uh, we were thinking that the big mill segregation would be feasible on a larger scale for the project, but what do you know, we entered into a global pandemic during the time <laughs> when we were delivering the Portland Airport project. And, you know, all of a sudden, the lumber market, as you all know, went crazy. We experienced record high pricing. And we went, we reached a point where Frank Lumber, our, you know, primary source of lamb stock, 
was saying they might not even want to cut two by eight material, which is what was needed for the glue lamb beam. They were saying it was more, you know, financially advantageous for them to make two by sixes and two by fours because that was what the market was demanding at that time. Um, and that was scary. So, you know, at that point it was like, okay, fine. You don't have to do the segregation, but will you please just cut the two by eight? <laughs> um, and I say that to everyone because there are external forces, you know, no matter how good of a specification you write and how hard, you know, how strong those relationships are, there are external forces that arise that may make this pathway unachievable, um, even if the mill is initially open to the idea. Um, and Paul, it took a lot of socializing with Frank and some, yeah. you know, to, to get them even open to this. So, um, yeah. So I just, I give that as a little bit of a cautionary kind of, um, you know, tale there. Uh, so I think for those reasons, this is the least scalable option, um, at least until I say transparency becomes more mainstream. And I think I'm looking at the comments and Lech, you're, you know, totally nail on the head. Like, yeah, we need to create greater demand for this kind of transparency. Um, and once that happens, um, we might see the tides change because mills will be used to this request, but we're not there yet. Um, so it'll, but that's not to say we shouldn't keep trying. We should keep trying. We just, we shouldn't be discouraged if we fail. Um, and, or if it turns out a little bit differently than we anticipated. And like this happy story of being able to buy logs from Herbert is a really awesome kind of, you know, um, thing that came out of, you know, uh, our effort. Yeah. Paul looked like you wanted to jump in there. Oh, I was just gonna, you know, Eric is totally right that this stuff in many cases took over a year and a half, two years. Uh, the, the six months was more specifically to the evaluating what fiber might be coming from a particular land ownership class. But I mean, in combination that with the RFP process and then working with the fabricators, absolutely. If you're gonna try to go for pathway three or four in particular, you know, there is a, a, and I would say that if you have time, you can solve for having pretty unique asks and having uh, to have to control costs. If you don't have time, then you're going to need a lot more money. Like there's just kind of a three, <laughs> three legged stool there and you can only really have two of them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and one quick note on, you know, even the pandemic thing with like Frank too, is like we built that relationship. It took, you know, multiple years, even before we bought anything from Frank, right? And even though they weren't willing to do that, they're still like, we'll still work with Elk Creek to have it be 100% FSC certified, right? And we'll still like, you know, work with you on transparency data, right? So like there was still that relationship, you know, through that process, Frank was still willing to do a lot of these asks out of, out of that ordinary, which is great because they provide like most yeah. of the lamb stock in general for products. So, so it was still a big win one. on that aspect. So they did pathway mm. one and pathway six, right? Yeah. Which we'll get. Yeah, that's a good segue into pathway five, which is small mill direct sourcing. Yeah, and this one, I think the stories are the most exciting and it's not very hard to explain here. So, uh, you know, <laughs> kind of what you're seeing there, uh, this really is a pretty unique situation for finding a, a, a small mill. And if you have um, a project where a particular aspect of the project, you really want to kind of go, go deep on, even if it's not a large volume, you can cover up, you can cover for the additional cost associated with a small mill not going to be at the same commodity price point as some of these other vendors are going to be. But what you get with that added cost when you're talking to your clients is you get this really beautiful story. Not that the other stories aren't beautiful, but it's just, you know, a lot and it becomes very personal, very quick. And so I think that's where I see the small mill playing a role. If there's a particular fiber source like the skylights in the airport or the siding, at OSU, I mean, you can just deliver something really unique to your client if you have the right small mill to, to do it and the right product in your project. Yeah, and so, in, you know, in lieu of a map, I just put Sustainable Northwest Woods logo on here because it is about mm -hmm. those personal connections and it's about knowing who to talk to, who can find that directly sourced um, kind of mill that is much smaller and much more obtainable. And, and you know, it's interesting. Uh, there's a reason why 
Ocean Cascades isn't on, you know, path three or four because we have an extremely tight budget and extremely fast schedule. And that's actually how we ended up with pathway five as well, because we kind of hit the easy button on the siding piece and say, okay, FSC Cedar siding, why not? But because this wasn't a lead project, we weren't tied to, we weren't chasing points with the FSC. We were just trying to do the right thing for something that we knew would be a limited scope in terms of the volume of wood that we needed. But then, you know, I think a lot of you folks know Terry over at Sands Northwest Wood, he like wrote me this long email. I was like, hey man, we really want to do the FSC Cedar, but right now you can only get that out of Canada because all these supply chain issues. But there's this family just down the road who's doing this thinning project on their private land. And, you know, we have the kind of chain of custody there and we have that relationship. And so, you know, it was, it was a no brainer and it was cheaper than the FSC Wood coming out of Canada. And it was a better story in terms of why the owner wants to use wood in the first place. And that's to support the local economy and support forest health. And so it was awesome because it just kind of all fell into place, even though that wasn't necessarily the intent at the outset. And so I think making sure that you have clear spec language, but also being flexible with kind of the curveballs that will be thrown at you over the course of the process due to all of the different issues that we've talked about um, really opens up opportunities for us to still be responsible in how we use wood on our projects. And so that's the, the next slide is just a, um, a volume of wood that we utilized. And, you know, uh, the job supported in is all over the place because really these little kind of small private pieces of land that are in need of active management are just kind of scattered shot. They're all over the place. And it's all about connecting the dots between where that those logs are getting harvested and where those mills are happening. And a lot of that goes through Sustainable Northwest storefront. Well, one thing I love about this too, is like, look how prominent this is featured on the building, right? I mean, I think that was one of the coolest things too, of like landowners sort of seeing that connection in the built environment and being like, that's my product. Like this isn't the studs in a wall, right? That's covered up, all of that still has its, its place and its story too, but it's pretty incredible too that like you could look at this and say this came from small families or you know was supported by a 10 acre you know single tree selection um harvest process awesome. yeah and i think the other thing too is is the application of it. it's siting so it's not a dimensional lumber that needs to end up in a glue limb or in uh you know clt or you know dlt or, or whatever so it seems like this, if you're just having it be the one-step process as opposed to the two-step process from the mill to the fabricator to the site, um, it's a little easier for the small mill direct sourcing to be feasible because there's fewer steps in the process. Most definitely. And, and we utilize the same pathway for some of the lattice ceiling as well, same mill, even casters, you know, custom cuts. And, um, you know, we primarily engage them along with Mankey, so we could actually increase the percentage that came from small family landowners, right? This happened later in the procurement process. So Paul and, and Ryan over at Sustainable Northwest Wood came and said, hey, we think we can get some, you know, small landowner wood in here. It would also involve small mill, and we think the timing would work out, and here's what the cost is. And, you know, the port was like, absolutely, whatever we can do to increase that percentage would be great. Um, and so we've got, I think, you know, five different landowners that came from this past pathway. It's roughly, I think, 60,000 board feet, right? Hila Woods and Honshu are kind of the two that are here. And like, we got to tour their forests, right? With our client and talk a little bit about, you know, Ben's out there working on trying to understand what is that right profit balance point between economy and ecology. The Hanshus are out there just sort of managing this beautiful forest to pass financial and aesthetic assets down to the next generation. I mean, it's so compelling, these stories, when you go out there and listen to them um, and to know that our wood came from that was really great. And all of these sources are really good, right? Camp Nemanu and Camp Adams. In fact, we're supporting two different, you know, camps that are like cultural gems, you know, to Portland. Then also another um, experimental forest from a university. It was great to be able to trace that too, as well. And, you know, when we look back through all of the different lattice sources, I mean, we could say that the largest opening size for that 600,000 board feet was 12 acres. It was a 12 acre patch cut with 10% retention, I think from Hila Woods. And so just understanding that and being able to communicate that, you know, to these various stakeholders has, has, has been really great. And, you know, back to Scott's point too, about like where do you hit the easy button versus where you don't. I mean, I think we were really fortunate to unlock some of those more intense pathways, but all six of these pathways represent 
a step forward in terms of transparency, right? And we've designed them as a spectrum from low effort, high scalability to high effort, low scalability. So we can all engage in this, you know, at the right scale for our projects and our clients and our relationships in the supply chain. Um, I'm going to propose that we just sort of skip to questions since we've only got roughly a couple of minutes. There's one more pathway, which is about if you have certified wood, you can do the same kind of disclosure pathway to understand the origins of those credits. And I think we could just leave it, leave it at that. Uh, just so you know, I'm going to get up and walk with my laptop because I'm getting kicked yeah. out of this building. Still listening, Scott. Yeah. Awesome, thank you guys, that was amazing. Um, usually we wrap up around 5.30, but as long as you guys are willing to stay and answer questions, then we can hang out as long as, uh, as you're feeling comfortable. So I'm sure there are questions out there and I'll just open it up to the, to the general audience here. You can just ask directly or raise your hand if you like. You can also put it in the chat. There's been a pretty good chat stream in general, <laughs> looking back through the comments. Yeah, there was there was one from Susan Jones that Paul um, partially addressed, and I can I can ask that again. Or Susan, are you still here? Is that something you want to ask out loud? I am here, um, but yeah, it's I mean it's kind of a personal thing because we have a family forest, and so I should just talk to to um, to directly. I don't want to take take your time, but I mean it's it's really this has been a really moving conversation because um, I really. I think the work that you guys have all done in the last few months, I missed the beginning. So I missed a little bit of context. And I know Jacob, your involvement on the on the on the airport has been key on this, but there has been a process that you've all gotten involved with. And I really am sorry I missed how that all how this all started. I got the six pathways, but um, whoever organized this, maybe it's Sustainable Northwest, um, really hats off and Tallwood Institute, hats off to all of you for, for partaking in this because this is the kind of transparency that we're all just crying out for and um, thank you all for for really getting some data points and some clarity uh, about the prescriptive issues and um, it's just so gratifying to see that we're going beyond and deeper and more thoughtfully you know than just the FSC uh, dialogues that we've had often in the past it's just I really appreciate this conversation a lot thanks for the comments thanks Susan, Susan. <laughs> Um, hi, this is Katie Kavanaugh um, from Oregon State University. Um, this has been really enlightening and I appreciate um, this discussion we've been having. We're looking at um, developing kind of a climate smart pathway for the wood coming off the Elliott State Research Forest, both in a practical context and in a research context. We're partnering um, with several tribes that also are in the region. And, and I have a couple questions. Um, one of them has to do with the price differential in wood that goes through these different paths, because the, one of the other paths that was implied but really wasn't discussed was sourcing using innovative forest harvesting techniques. So whether it's single tree selection versus clear cutting um, short rotations, short rotations versus long rotations, all those incur a fairly hefty cost to the producer relative to business as usual. So, so I, I, I was kind of curious how, if you saw a price premium for the landowners as opposed to the mill owners. Great so, question. Or go ahead, Paul. Yeah, you're probably best suited to answer this, you and Erica. So I would say there's, I mean, different land, different cultural practices. Absolutely, there's a lot of different ways to, to evaluate um, cost and, you know, there's different values that go into different ownership types. Uh, like the ones you're describing would have a very different um, kind of value set and, and need. Um, I think there's external costs and internal costs and, and we could spend a lot of time on that. But I, and I'd love to on a separate call, I, I'd say that the key piece we're trying to do here is just to, to create the, the pathways that would then allow a project who had particular opinions on what you're describing to connect with the forests that they, that they want to connect with. And, and that, that that's the first 
step towards saying if a landowner is being asked to do more, whether it's a regulatory piece in a certain state or ownership type, or whether it's voluntary, is there a way that the market can really bring value to that landowner? And then the question is, okay, well, how much more is it going to cost if you're going to have more retention or longer rotations or some of these components? And, and, and I do think that that's relevant uh, to this conversation, but, but what we, there's so much conversation going on in those spaces that we, at least for this presentation, really just focused on the, can you build the, the understanding and connection to forest of origin and and then based on what I've experienced as a wood advisor on different projects, each client is going to have their own desires for how they want to define that. And, and then they're going to engage in their own, in their own ways. And certainly our hope in some of these pathways we've shared tonight, there has been a premium paid. I think in most markets, the, the end user does pay a premium when they're asking some of these questions. Um, but it is really a, a, a wide grade of, of close to 0% premium all the way up to sometimes I've seen, you know, vendors say really very, very extreme premiums. And so what we did find for the Portland airport, I think Jake could speak to, um, but I think when you, when you have flexibility and when you're moving towards pathway one or two, I think you start moving towards a premium that's pretty reasonable. I'd like to chime in on this. Um, and yep. Paul, I hope you can correct me if I'm wrong or if I'm a little bit off base here, but um, I think one of the challenges that some of us experience with chain of custody certifications is that we, we don't have the proof that the premium is being passed on to the landowner. Um, and that landowner is the one who's really making the sacrifice as you're alluding to. Um, by choosing to harvest less or choosing to harvest later um, or choosing to harvest differently in a less kind of economically intensive way. Um, and we don't know if they're benefiting or if they're, you know, if they're being, if they're being rewarded for that um, decision. And uh, so What's interesting about these other pathways that we're exploring, and you'll notice none of them are targeting industrial forestry. Um, like some of the, you know, these landowners are motivated for, by different, have different motivations, right? They have different value propositions and they're not beholden to, um, you know, a board of directors or, you know, they're not focused on bottom line profit. And so they're managing different ways. Um, and I think um, there's just, you know, this question of how much is enough. And that's something that struck me when we visited. Uh, that's something that struck me when we visited the the Woods project. It's like, um, and I can't remember Ben's dad's, but Ben, ben Peter. Pays. Was it Peter? Peter was saying that, um, you know, he's trying to find this balance of like, how much is enough? How much do we need basically to earn from, how much revenue do we need to generate from this forest? Um, I only want enough, basically. I don't need as much as possible. Um, and so there are landowners that, out there that just don't have the same mandates about prof, you know, to meet a certain profit margin. And so it's exciting to support that kind of different financial model that is more kind of, triple bottom line driven. And I definitely want to echo everything that Paul and Eric said. I think I think that's spot on. And this is such a great question, I think, to ask in these contexts, because I think that, you know, right now it's not necessarily rewarded in the market if you're doing, you know, low impact forestry that's like not nearly as efficient as industrial forestry, right? You pay, you, it, you, uh, pay the same amount for that log, or at least we do typically, right? It's not true in all cases, but it's generally true. It's a commodity, right? That price doesn't fluctuate for the most part, depending upon the kind of forestry that produced it, right? And part of that reason is just without the traceability and trackability in the supply chain, there's no way to differentiate other than if you're a small mill, right? And you just naturally, you know, have, are able to do that or find those markets. So one thing that we really liked is with this, there is another possible way to form a connection with the forester to where you can start to have that conversation around bidding structure, procurement, direct payments, carbon offsets, you know, paying for climate smart forestry, stuff like that. And the one sort of success story out of our project was with the Skokomish Hilltop sale, right? Is that when Mankey um, bought that uh, or 
went after that timber cell, they increased their bid because they knew that it was conformant material to our specifications. It was highly desired. So they upped their bid beyond what they were gonna do normally. And um, the Hilltop sale, uh, Skiscomber said they did receive a premium for that. So that is like one example of like, with the targeting, with the transparency, with that criteria, we were able to direct a premium to the landowner. But that's rare, and I think that this differentiation can start to help that. Yeah, yeah. Elaine just made a great. Elaine, ha Elaine has a nice comment in yeah. there too. That, and I think it's also true in the tribal case too. That tribes um, also have some unique desires, um, but the equity issue of being asked to provide something but not being paid for what it is, what it costs is, is one to discuss further. But. Yeah, and just reinforcing that, um, Elaine um, O'Neill in the chat saying that typically small forest landowners get less, not more than the industrial landowner. I think, you know, that I mean in terms of the cost or the cost benefit ratio. So they're not setting the price, they're taking it and the loggers typically charge them more to harvest than they well, for a large scale project, voice of experience, right? So there is this disconnect, absolutely. And yeah. that the burdens of that kind of forestry are not reflected in, in the way the money gets transferred through the supply chain. Yep. I, Thanks, Elaine, for the comment. I would say that to that comment and the, the kind of equity piece there, all markets that are treated as a commodity struggle with that. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think it's, probably relevant to look to food because a lot of people have cared more about the origin of their food since you put it in your mouth. And I think <laughs> when, when we look there, the places where landowners are compensated are the places where they do establish direct relationship to market. So I think if I were, we didn't cover it like very in, in detail here on this call, but I do think if that is our goal, there are some models out there that suggest that this might be the right path. And, and I think we're, we're just beginning. And what Jacob mentioned in terms of a premium being paid directly to a landowner, those are pretty um, you know, unique scenarios. But I think if we, can, if we build this and we build the transparency, the relationships will be there to continue to find success. And, and that is certainly my hope. Mm. Erica just said she's looking forward to part two. So that might need to it. that's my little plug. What, that is. <laughs> <laughs> but what is part two? That's the question. I guess maybe uh, since we're getting a little bit towards the late side, we can just wrap up with uh, a question, which is, yeah, what are the next steps? Is there a part two or I don't know? What are your follow-up thoughts mm -hmm. on all this? Yeah. Is the part two kind of what's next with the folks that are on the panel? in what we're doing with projects moving forward? Or is it what next in terms of some of these questions that are peripheral to the pathways conversation in terms of what people are asking for in terms of civil culture? I would be curious, I guess, um, next steps specifically for you guys in terms of projects, but then also um, it, was, it was spoken to a little bit by Erica, but I guess, how do you increase the storytelling surrounding this work that you guys have done? How do you sort of disseminate this and, and bring it into practicable action um, beyond where it is right now? So we are scaling what we're, we're there's, there's a few pilots here that we're presenting now and, and there's certainly a plan to do uh, kind of a next level to kind of, can we do this across different scales, whether it's um, affordable housing in addition to the academic and, and public? And you know, can you start moving it towards private where it's just standard investment money that's being used? And can we leverage this approach to help with the capital stack? And so I think that's the, the next step that we're seeing in, in terms of how can we bring this to scale across a diverse set of projects? And so we do have, Sustainable Northwest has Wood Innovations um, asking to try to do this with 10 projects and the story map that's gonna be created for the Portland airport, I think this summer. So. Uh, the, the, the other what next is, I think some of this begs the question of a project asking these questions sometimes is almost too late. And so to, to map fiber supply chains from particular forests of origin and, and ownership types so that people know which vendors have what product to offer offhand as a natural part of their supply chain. So if you wanted to connect with a tribally managed forest or a small family forest operator or a mill that's doing a lot of work with post-fire recovery and fire resilience, you know, kind of which which vendors are the natural vendors a project might approach. 
And so there's some proactive work being done to try to map out those fiber sources that I, I'm personally very excited about. I, I think I'd probably need to leave the, uh, the panelists to each answer that question for our for each of our <laughs> own firms, but that's where Sustainable Northwest is going. Erica, do you want to go go next before I? No, and I actually have to I have to run to go pick up my my kids, but um, <laughs> I'm really grateful for the conversation, and um, it's nice to to be with you all. So I'm just gonna say bye. Thanks, Erica. <laughs> Thanks so much, Erica. Thanks, Erica. <clears throat> Yeah, so next steps for me is just to be Paul's best friend. I think if I can achieve that, <laughs> it'll just lead to so many things opening up, you know, for me in this realm. Um, so that's step one. Step two, uh, there's kind of two tangible next steps, I think, that will help us with that pathway one. That's like what I'm most focused on in terms of scaling that out, getting those tools in architect's hands so we can have this consistent ask. So I've been trying to get off the ground sort of like a spec writing group to actually come up and workshop the specifications that we have with T-Core and say, how can we make this clear, right? How can we do that? And we've got a pretty good draft. Uh, so you need a spec, the reporting template, which is something Paul and I have been working on, very difficult to come up with a simple Excel or whatever reporting template that you could include in that spec to give to contractor Erica, fabricator mill, right? But that's those are the two things that are critical. And then I'm hoping to create these like decision-making flow chart roadmaps that talk about engaging a client and what their goal is. And depending upon that goal, here's your questions to the supply chain and when, right? And so then to Paul's point, sometimes it's too late. At least we can map out in general when you need to start engaging the supply chain, who, what questions to ask, depending upon which pathway you're doing. I think that would be an incredible tool to make just to be able to understand the steps that a design team needs to take to engage in these pathways. Uh, I have a question. This is Timothy Cook from Albert Architecture. I think this, this presentation and discussion has been incredibly insightful and I would love to advocate for this recording to be available publicly. Um, I think there's a, an incredible amount of valuable information that's been shared today. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll publish this as long as all the presenters are fine with it. I usually follow up after the fact and verify that we can put it up on uh, online. So um, we'll, put the, we'll put the link up. You can find us on YouTube. Excellent. Yeah, email us and I'll check in with our you know, PR folks and make sure everything's good or if there's any redactions that need to be done. But yeah, I think it'd be, it would be great too. Um, absolutely. Jake, was there something, I remember you mentioning that ZGF, I think was putting out like a carbon playbook. Is that something that's true and you wanna mention or is that another, for another time? Um, another time, I mean, that's really more for like all scope one, two and three emissions, you know, for like architects and stuff. I mean, it would be great to talk about climate smart forestry, right? And I know that there's some other groups out there, the Paul's been on procurement groups, right? To try to understand actionable pathways and what it takes, but like, I mean, it would be wonderful to have Climate Smart Forestry 101 or like what's the state of the state. And I think we might like, I can't remember which groups I've already talked to you about this, but um, yeah, that would be one potential thing to talk about the research around, you know, carbon stock change factors. And, you know, we've been working on a tool with um, University of Washington, right, called Upstream that um, is meant to do these calculations along with more advanced like end of life calculations. We're not quite there on the forest factors yet, but we could literally have a, a great conversation. I'm sure Kathleen has a lots of um, opinions too about like climate smart forestry. What is it and what's the state of the state now? Could be fun. Sure. Well, it seems like there's a lot of follow-ups. Um, I think maybe we should call it so everybody can go home and eat dinner or if you're already home then just eat dinner or whatever. Um, so thank you guys so much for taking the time to do this. This was really, really interesting, engaging. Uh, I feel like everybody here was really thankful to hear from you and learned a lot. So um, oh, thanks for having us. Yeah. Thanks, Evan. Have a good Great. evening, all. Thanks all for right. the people who made it through the entire presentation. <laughs> <laughs>